My very first parish, uh, St John Stoke uh, in Guildford, Surrey, is situated uh, next door to what's known as Guildford College. And uh, in my time there, we occasionally held uh, events for the students and faculty. Before ordination, I'd spent four years working as a student evangelist. So when the chaplaincy of the college uh, became vacant, we asked the bishop whether the two posts could be uh, combined. And we heard nothing for months. Eventually, when I pressed him, I was told that it was felt somehow inappropriate for an evangelical to be appointed as the chaplain of an academic institution. And then to rub it in, when I proposed undertaking a part-time postgraduate degree to the director of training, he asked me rather cynically whether I was going to buy it from America. Well, that was all the motivation I needed uh, to pursue a master's degree through Oxford University. And uh, after that, I became an area tutor for the course and then eventually uh, was awarded my PhD. I can therefore relate to how the Apostle Paul must have felt when he was mocked uh, by the Christians in Corinth for his lack of eloquence or his oratory skills. Let me read to you what uh, John Stott has to say in his book, uh, Calling Christian Leaders. He says, as Hudson Taylor affirmed in the 19th century, all God's giants have been weak people. This was in contrast to the false teachers, he says, whom Paul dubbed super apostles in chapter 11 of his second letter. They were proud and uh, self-confident and boasted of their wisdom, authority and power. That's because rhetoric uh, was the systematic academic discipline taught and practiced throughout the Greek and Roman world. In fact, he says in the first century, uh, AD, rhetoric became the primary discipline in Roman higher education. In public debates, in the law courts and at funerals, rhetoric was tremendously popular as a form of public entertainment. Gradually it became an end in itself because the goal was applause, the motive was vanity and the casualty was truth. This is why the Christians in Corinth looked down on Paul, because they'd assimilated to the cultural norms of the day. And that's a temptation in every generation. You only have to look at the uh, agenda uh, of items being discussed in our church synods to figure out how well we are resisting that temptation today. So I've entitled uh, this exposition of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 um, Paul's Strong Reproofs for a Scandalous Church. It's taken from Chuck Swindle's brilliant little Bible study guide, which I again recommend uh, based on this passage. Let me uh, observe three things from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want us to look at Paul's method Paul's motivation and Paul's message. First of all, Paul's methods were humanly weak. He says in verses one to three, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. You see, rather than deny their criticisms, Paul readily acknowledges his weakness. In fact, in his second letter, Paul even quotes them as saying, his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. That's 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. They said Paul was nothing much to look at or indeed to listen to. And rather than give them excuses, Paul actually boasts of his weaknesses. He says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, said Paul, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I wonder if you've found that to be true in your life. Have you recognised that when you are weak, that's most likely when you will be strong spiritually? You'll really only find that out when you face insults, hardships, persecutions. Let me give you one example of that. Charles Spurgeon is probably the uh, most influential preacher in the 19th century in the UK. A good principle or example of power and weakness. As a young man, Spurgeon stuttered. All his life he struggled with depression. Later he had regular attacks of gout and occasionally was in such pain. While preaching he had to put one knee on a chair while he clung on to the pulpit. But that was nothing compared to what he had to suffer in public. He said he felt terribly sick before preaching as if he was crossing the English Channel. But in addition to these physical symptoms, he suffered slanderous attacks from the media. He was only 19 when he first came to London and the Saturday Review called him, quote, a coarse, stupid, irrational bigot. Later, they called him an ignorant, conceited, fanatic. Indeed, there were many cartoons and caricatures that made fun of him. But he persevered. An astonishing power attended his ministry. You know, that's so very true of countless others since. As a young pastor, I remember being taught a very simple principle. If your knees are knocking, kneel on them. And if you don't feel sick in the stomach as you stand up to preach or when you step down from the pulpit, then find another vocation. You see, Paul was not afraid when he was afraid. He was not afraid to admit it. Are you able to do that? Paul's methods were humanly weak. Secondly, Paul's motivation was to make Jesus known. Verses three to five, he says, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of God's power so that uh, your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power, the Spirit's power. That's why Paul didn't take elocution lessons. It's why he probably didn't begin his sermons with an entertaining joke or try and wow his audience with rhetoric. Because Paul simply wanted to point people to Jesus, not to draw attention to himself. And that's because Paul knew that only God can open blind eyes. Only God can raise the dead. Only Jesus Christ crucified can take away our sin. If that was Paul's motivation, what about yours? What is your motivation in life? Is it to impress or is it to implore? To draw attention to yourself or to point people to Jesus? Paul's methods were humanly weak. Paul's motivation was to make Jesus known. And thirdly, Paul's message was God's wisdom for living. He says, verses 7 to 10, We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. Three things we can say about this wisdom. It's a wisdom that is personal because it's God's wisdom, a mystery. And that word mystery simply means secret. 
It's a knowledge that remains a secret until it is revealed by God. Then it is crystal clear. That means you won't find it in books. You won't find it through an internet search engine or on Wikipedia. It's God's wisdom revealed. And although it's a secret wisdom, it's not difficult to find. The Apostle James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given you. See, God's wisdom is only a prayer away. God's wisdom is personal. It's from God to you and me. Secondly, it's a wisdom that's been prepared. God has prepared, says Paul, for those who love him before the world began. Is he prepared in the sense of God's foreknowledge? It's a wisdom that God knows you need. It's a, it's a knowledge, a wisdom that God knows we need today and tomorrow. He knows how to enable us to grow up, how to become mature, to make wise decisions that will glorify him, that will fulfill his perfect will. Wisdom that will help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's a wisdom that's personal, a wisdom that's prepared, and it's a wisdom that's purposeful. You see, God has destined for our glory. It's a very unusual expression, verse 7. But that word glory speaks of the future God has prepared for your life and mine. It's a future orientated wisdom. You know, we can so easily become trapped by guilt from the past or fear of the future. But God has wisdom that enables us to break free from the past as we see our life from his perspective. It means that with that wisdom we can enjoy him and trust him in the present. Today's the only day we've got. We're one breath, one heartbeat away from eternity. And it's a wisdom that will help us to trust him with our future. Discovering God's purpose for your life is the most important thing you can ever do. You know the most popular non-fiction book in history? It's Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. What on earth am I here for? I warmly commend it to you. In it, Rick Warren says, God has a five-fold purpose for your life. He says you were planned for God's pleasure to know and to love him. Secondly, you were formed for God's family to find a home, brothers and sisters. Thirdly, you were created to become like Jesus Christ with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. The character of Christ worked out in us. Fourthly, we were shaped for serving God. God gives us talents, skills and passion. They're given to us not by accident, but for a purpose. And then fifthly, we were made for mission. To introduce other people to God's five purposes for them as well. I strongly recommend the book. But as a very young Christian, the other book that's probably helped me most, apart from the Bible, is Jim Packer's book. Knowing God. I remember devouring it uh, just a few months after I became a Christian and it opened so many uh, uh, parts of the Bible and helped me helped make sense of them so much. In uh, Knowing God, there's a really good summary of God's purposes for us. So I'm going to close by reading it. Jim says, do I as a Christian understand myself? Do I know my own real identity, my own real destiny? I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. My saviour is my brother. Every Christian is my brother and sister too. He says, say it over and over to yourself. First thing in the morning, last thing in the night. <clears throat> As you wait for the bus, any time your mind is free, 
<coughs> excuse me, and ask that you may be enabled to live as one who knows it is all utterly and completely true. For this is the Christian secret of the happy life. Yes, certainly. But we have something both higher and profounder to say. This is the Christian secret of the Christian life, of the God honouring life. May this secret become fully yours and fully mine. In today's epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we've seen Paul's methods were humanly weak. Secondly, Paul's motive was to make Jesus known. And thirdly, Paul's message was God's wisdom for living. A wisdom revealed that is personal, prepared and purposeful. The Westminster Shorter Catechism sums up God's purpose in one sentence. The very first question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. May you indeed enjoy God today as you discover his perfect will for your life and in response glorify him in all you think, all you say and all you do. Amen.